Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Wednesday night at a new time, 8.30 p.m., and we are here to take you behind the bima. I'm joined together with Rabbi Moskowitz and Rabbi Brody, and what an honor we have this evening to welcome Dr. Leonard Schleifer with us, a legend not only in his industry, a leader in the Jewish community, and a dear friend of our family, and so, so grateful on what is an extraordinarily busy time in general, and busy day in particular for you, that you have found a few minutes to be with us tonight. Dr. Schleifer, thank you so, so much. It's good to be here. Thank you. I want to just give a quick uh, background, although uh, everybody knows um, Dr. Schleifer is the founding CEO of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, began in 1989, a uh, very innovative company that has won all kinds of awards and recognition for science and innovation, and maybe we'll get to also for being the best biotech pharmaceutical company to work for in the world, has crafted an incredible culture at the company itself, a company of thousands of employees. Uh, today is FDA approved for drugs that are healing people, uh, ILEA for um, AMD, which is the leading cause of blindness, a drug for asthma and for dermatitis, a drug approved for certain types of cancers, a treatment for Ebola, which is waiting approval, and of course, very much in the news, a, a drug right now in trial for, um, for uh, COVID-19, which the president just today credited for healing him. That is not our topic for tonight, and it's not why we welcome him. I'm sure that's a, a refreshing relief, at least for this conversation, for Dr. Schleifer. Dr. Schleifer, we have you on. We've known you a long time um, because we want to talk to you about, about your Jewishness, about your, your Jewish neshama and how it informs how you built this magnificent company, which is award-winning, which is successful, which is changing the face of medicine, which is healing people both for uh, drugs that are necessary at blockbuster levels and also for orphan diseases that are not necessarily profitable are making a real difference in the lives of hundreds of people, not thousands or millions around the world who need it. What is it about your, your upbringing, your Jewishness uh, that informs the work that you do? Well, thanks, uh, Rabbi, to have me. Let me just start by, uh, you said a, a lot of nice things about the company and uh, all those nice things are due to our fabulous employees. Uh, and most recently, those employees have been uh, laboring away um, at what was the epicenter of the uh, a pandemic uh, for COVID-19, uh, right in Westchester County, New York, literally the epicenter. Uh, and they were risking their lives, their lives, the lives of their family, uh, but they knew they had a mission that they had to do. Uh, and that's the kind of company we built. And um, I'm very proud of that. I should say it hasn't always been all that rosy and it's taken, it took us um, almost 20 years. The company was actually founded in 1988. We didn't turn a profit until 2012. Uh, and we had poured out uh, a, maybe a couple of billion dollars. Uh, so it's a really remarkable story. And frankly, um, we wouldn't be here for all those employees. And one employee in particular, kept us afloat, was one of the most critical people in our entire organization, and somebody who um, is, I believe, a member of the shul, if certainly uh, a son uh, of him is uh, the rabbi of the shul. Uh, I have to say, uh, Yashikov, to um, my close, close friend, my dear friend, Murray Goldberg, for Murray stood by us uh, for two decades and shepherded us and, and directed us and and taught us, frankly, taught me many Jewish values um, over lunch uh, uh, or in various meetings. Uh, and without him, we wouldn't uh, have made it. So I should call you. Murray, uh, and um, uh, you should be very proud of your uh, of your yichis, uh, if you will, Rabbi. Absolutely, um, every day. So, you know, I was brought up in a um, uh, traditional home in the sense of um, my my father was from Williamsburg. Um, he read, read the forward every day. To, uh, his parents spoke Yiddish at home. Um, but I, my upbringing was not, I would say, overly uh, observant. Um, we, were, um, um, we went to the Regal Park Jewish Center, which was a conservative shul in Queens, New York. I was bar mitzvah. And that was about the extent of my Jewish uh, training. Um, my wife, Harriet, my, my, my wife of over 45 years, um, has a different story and brought a lot of my Jewish thinking. And we've known each other since high school and we're married at a very tender age. And, um, and she's been my life partner. And um, she comes from a family of Holocaust survivors. 
So for her, there was a whole other aspect of her Judaism, which was extremely important to her. For her, it was really important that we kept the kosher home. Um, uh, she became president of our shul. Uh, it was a conservative shul. She wouldn't be able to do it, I guess, in your synagogue, but she was pretty good. She lamed. Uh, she's done uh, the Haftorah on, uh, on Yom Kippur. She's, she's really uh, um, taken this um, uh, to great um, uh, spirituality. Uh, and, and she uh, davens virtually every week uh, in, in Shula and Shabbat. Um, so my uh, being informed about Judaism really came in a lot through my, through my marriage, I would say, um, and understanding how important the Lador Vador from generation to generation was for us. Um, I do think that some of my upbringing reflected my father's fear of anti-Semitism. Uh, my father um, grew up, he went on a, uh, in Williamsburg, as I said, he went on a scholarship to Cornell, um, where he uh, uh, got a scholarship because of he excelled in Latin and Greek, but he didn't have any money, he had to sweep floors, and he couldn't go to medical school uh, because he was Jewish and he didn't have any money back. This was in 1933. Um, but he always told me that become a doctor or something like that, because he felt that Therefore, I would be protected. I could pursue the important art of healing on the one hand. On the other hand, I could insulate myself from what his fears of anti-Semitism that he saw when he was growing up and he couldn't advance in any corporate world or anything like that. So that part of me was instilled from my, my dad. The, the more traditional um, Judaism, the post-Shoah uh, mentality came really from my wife, Harriet. Um, she, I should say she's president of the uh, American Jewish Committee, which is a great global organization. Um, and uh, so that's how I became informed. Um, basically, and, and, sorry. No, that's okay. I was going to ask. And, and Regeneron, as I said, is a special place because while it has gained such distinction and accomplishment in, in a for-profit industry and as a public company, it has a very big soul and a big heart, um, not only towards its employees, and maybe you could speak about the culture, um, but as I alluded to earlier, even in the diseases that it's trying to heal. And I'll say very personally, um, I have a friend who I, I love very much who, who suffers from FOP, and I know Regeneron is doing research in, in trying to heal that. That's an orphan disease, that there's maybe a few hundred people in the whole world who have it. So not everything Regeneron does is, is really about the bottom line or the profit it can make, but it's about trying to heal diseases. And I wonder, I know that that you and Dr. Yankopoulos, you're not just um, scientists, you're not just PhDs, but you practiced as a neurologist at NYU Hospital. How does the fact that you interacted with patients and you've seen their suffering, and how does that inform your desire to, not just about the bottom line, but to really heal the illnesses and to really leave suffering? You know, it was Cornell, by the way, New York Hospital Cornell. and Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I did my clinical training. I, I, my father brought us up, uh, my brother and I, uh, that he said that you should do well by doing good. Um, and so that was sort of the philosophy, do well by doing good. Um, not, not just do well, not just go out and make money and do that, but do good. And that should be the root, okay? Uh, that should be what the uh, where the fruit comes from. It's the doing good. And when you're a doctor, I learned that. Um, I sat with people um, of all faiths, including Orthodox and, and religions of other uh, uh, of all across the spectrum, and watched them held their hand while they while they died of cancer um, in Sloan Kettering. It was very tough to do that as a young doctor and as a neurologist. Um, and I have to say that that I always felt that if we took care of the patients and we put the patients first, the profits will follow. Um, and, uh, we're in business to make money for our shareholders. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Innovation needs to be rewarded, but it cannot be the, at the forefront, it has to be the result of doing uh, the, the right thing. And that's what we've done. Your father and I, we always talked about that. We're just gonna do the right thing. And then it's not hard. Um, because our values teach us what the right thing is. You know, a lot of Christian thought, they say, um, do unto others as, as you would have, uh, do un as they would do, you would like them to do to you. I believe that's actually uh, uh, in, in the Torah. I don't think that's a New Testament concept. You, you right. rabbis up there can correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> about that. But I believe that you'll find that in the Torah. And th that notion of treating people right, treating people fairly, 
Um, ultimately, my dad went into the business of uh, he manufactured sweaters in a small business in Williamsburg. And he always told me as a little boy that if you treat your employees well, you'll have the best employees in the world. And it's not a profound concept, but people lose track of that. Um, and they're so worried about every um, dollar aspect, they forget the human aspect. And, and we're, we try to put the human aspect first. That, that is beautiful and is absolutely a Torah value. It's, it's so critical. Unfortunately, it's increasingly rare today. Are there some examples in the culture of the company that you could share with us or that you can inspire others in their, own, in their own business and their own career to try to bring that to the culture of what they do, how to put what's right before even what's profitable? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I'll give you a couple of, uh, of, 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 uh, couple lines of evidence about that, one of them you mentioned, and then, and, and then maybe phil our philosophy. One of the, the lines of evidence that we are doing the right thing is that um, of all the companies in the entire industry you mentioned, I'm most proud of this, is that for the last, I think, six of the last seven years, we were the number one employer, the number one employer voted by Science Magazine and employees around the industry um, to work for. Um, that's, that's a, 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 to me, was always a, a great example of, uh, th that was a great recognition. And why did, wh what, how did we get there? Well, what did we do? The first thing I thought was important um, from a business, if you're going to be in business, is everybody has to feel they're part of the business. And there's no better way to make people part of the business, okay, is the same thing being part of a shul or anything else. You have to feel ownership. You have to feel it's yours, okay? It matters. If there's a, if, if there's a piece of litter, you know, um, on the grounds of the shul, it's your shul. You're going to pick that up. Well, everybody we generate on is an owner. They all get every single person right down to the guy who's a, a, a gal who might be cleaning out the, the cages for the animals to taking care of the, 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 the property. We have a loading dock person who was with us for so many years and he became an owner. Every year we gave him a, another little piece. He became a millionaire, literally. Um, and, you know, your father and I are very proud of all the way that we were able not only to reward our shareholders, but to make owners and shareholders out of our employees. I think that was a big secret uh, that, uh, that I think that if you want to talk more philosophically about solving some of the problems we have in our society, um, I'm not convinced we have so much as a, as a wealth gap in our society as we do have a capital gap. And what I mean by that is that capital is getting a large share of the of the pie over labor in our society. And that's not sustainable. And one of the ways to fix that is to make people who work part of the ownership and make them feel in their heart that it matters if they come to work. It's not just punching the clock. That to us was a great example. Another example I'll give you is that most companies, when they want to work on a disease, they sit down with a lot of actuarial fancy people uh, people, maybe even in your father's profession, uh, you know, financially uh, oriented people, and they decide what you're allowed to work on based on how much money you might work. We never did that. We just didn't believe in that. We just said, if we have a good idea and it can help a million people or a hundred people, we're going to do our best to pursue all of that. Of course, there's always pressures that push you to want to go to larger markets and so forth. But you get rewarded in strange ways in this world. You do something good for FOP, which might be 100 people. And before you know it, maybe you're fixing all sorts of other diseases. So we don't try and determine the market opportunity never really determines. It's can we do good for patients? Can we really do good for patients? I know your time is very limited today, and we're we're so appreciative of it. Maybe one one more question or or two more questions if we can sneak in. But I'm willing um, to talk. It's rare that I get to talk to three rabbis at the same time. <laughs> okay, perfect, yeah. great. We're we're in no rush, um, so we really really appreciate that. I just so, want to hear the debate at nine o'clock and. And you, well, we'll have you off by then, no question. <laughs> Although our show tends to be more entertaining than that, but we'll but we'll we'll let you off by then. So, um, Dr. Schleifer, you're an increasingly public personality. 
Um, and that is the cost of success in some ways. Um, and that means that you're in the spotlight. And, and maybe you've never been in the spotlight more than this week, maybe not more than today. Obviously, with, with Regeneron having this experimental treatment, which could be game changing. And I'm not bringing that up because it, it's inappropriate. It's not for tonight. My question to you is, as three rabbis who are in much smaller ways public personalities or speaking to anyone out there, how do you as a person deal with, with criticism? How do you balance doing what you know it's right? And then as a public person, you'll see this is an apolitical podcast and I Regeneron's an apolitical uh, company and 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 I know that you you helped the president and you made an offer to help the other nominee for president for vice president Biden if he or his team god forbid would need it um and yet no matter what you do there's always going to be haters out there there's going to be the people who criticize where do you find the the strength how can you give inspiration or guide others into how to into how to navigate that and I'll just ask a corollary of that even, even when we promoted you'd be on tonight, I got several texts saying, I know somebody who's got COVID. Can you get me the Regeneron cocktail? Which of course I can't. You know, obviously you need to, in any, in any trial you're running, you're giving placebo to a certain percentage of the people. It's got to break your heart to know there are people with illness who you could be healing, who the system necessitates you're giving placebo to. Yeah. So how do you navigate the feelings of the heart with, with the head in doing what's right? That's how rabbis ask questions, by the way. We ask like three or four at a time, but it's only one question. It's yeah, just one I, I, I get it. Um, I, I think there's, um, uh, let me deal with this placebo issue because it's a very important issue. Um, I was hauled on to 60 Minutes like 20 years ago, say, telling us, your dad will remember this, they, they, they said that, that it was, that it was it, they would call it a Shanda, but they didn't use those words, that I would have a cure for Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a terrible disease, as you know, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And I'm giving people a placebo while other people are throwing away their canes. How can I live with myself? It's a very good question. The answer is, is that it's called equipoise. I don't know that we actually have a treatment until we study it. And the most valuable thing I can give to a patient is informative and science evidence-based decision that evidence-based information allows them to reach a decision whether it might actually be helping them. And so if I short circuit this process, I might be putting out hydroxychloroquine, which by the way, I don't believe helps. Okay. And the evidence showed that it didn't. And that might stop people from having enrolled in our trial where maybe two thirds got the drug and one got a placebo. But the, I, what I'm trying to get across is that our obligation is to get a good answer as fast as possible. And I promise you, as soon as we think we have enough information, we're going to try and get that approved for everybody. But until we do, we may actually harm people. So when we give a placebo, it turns you, some studies, it turns out, you're better off having got the placebo because the drug actually was harmful. So that's what it's all about. We give people informed consent um, and they understand that. But th that's how we um, put our head down on the pillow, if you will, uh, because we know we're doing the right thing by getting information um, available, um, the best kind of information. That's a, that's a great explanation, and I think it should make everybody feel, you know, comfortable to know that about medicines. They'd rather they be, go through the process, and it's and it's necessary in terms of how you balance being this this public personality. Yeah, is there gonna... Do you not read that stuff? Do you avoid it? Uh -huh. do you just do the best. You know, you can? I have to tell you, uh, the Schleifer household um, over the last six months has been quite the place. Uh, my son uh, ran for Congress amongst fourteen people to take me to Lowy's place. He, he came in second in the Democratic primary. I think he would have come in first, but for the fact that they tried to tar and feather him that he was the son of a rich, evil biopharma person. Um, I hope they feel less so about us now. Um, uh, some of those people who were laying body bags in our driveway, you know, that was what, that's the kind of stuff was going on. So that was going on while he was running literally for Congress, they were doing this stuff. My wife, was leading this global organization, American Jewish Committee, AJC, which was dealing with this huge uptick in anti-Semitism around the world that they were trying to uh, fight and deal with um, helping uh, Israel in terms of its democracy and its peace and so forth. And I was trying to deal with COVID. So the Schleifer family, um, we didn't have that much time. I must say it, 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 it affects all of us a little differently. My wife 
got very angry at the people um, who attacked her son and my son just because they, he was our son, you know, as though that was uh, some evil uh, choice he made to be our son. Um, and uh, so I think the answer, the advice, let me, let me phrase it in advice. You can try and re, uh, lead your life by, if you're a public person like I have become, by reacting to what the public is saying and trying to mold what you do uh, so that the public feels, uh, you, uh, that you think you're doing what the public wants to do, or you can do what you think is the right thing and then do your best to convince the public that you that what you're doing is the right thing. I choose the latter, okay? And that's how I deal with this. And you know what? I'm not gonna convince everybody. Um, I'm sure all of you give sermons and not everybody, well, maybe Rev Goldberg, everybody loves his sermons, but maybe there's somebody- 100%. That, that maybe somebody doesn't like your sermon. And so, but you wanna impart a message and you don't, you don't give a sermon to try and win a popularity contest. You wanna give a sermon that you think is important and you hope that by showing that leadership that people will like that, but you, it's, it's, you must turn it around. You've got to lead, you've got to show the world that you will do the right thing. You know, there's all sorts of nonsense that's going on that the president got the, the drug because I'm his best friend, you know, which is really, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I, I, I just wanna say a word about that, you know, so that we put that issue to rest. There are many people on the extreme right the extreme right, who have told me, it doesn't matter whether it works, Len, put the stuff out there. And there are many people on the extreme left, the extreme left, who have said, Len, if, if you can, whatever you got, don't save him and bring it out after, after the election. Wow. That's the craziness. That's the, 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 the disastrous uh, situation we find ourselves in because Jewish ethics would never allow you to do either. You would exactly. never, ever bring forth something that was quackery uh, to achieve a goal. And you certainly never, never, ever would you hold back something that could save a soul, save a life. And so, but we have people on these extremes who actually feel this way. And this has got to stop. Somehow it's got to stop. Now, we're, we shouldn't underestimate the amount of stress that we're all under. I'm under a lot of stress, but everybody's under a lot of stress with with COVID and changing our lives. And, and boy, I would have rather flown down to, uh, to you guys in Florida, in sunny Florida, and we could have played a round of golf maybe. Uh, you know, that, that might have been more interesting than this Zoom, but we adopt. Um, at any rate, my bottom line on, 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 on notoriety is that I try and lead my life by doing the right thing. And if the public isn't getting it, I'm just gonna redouble my efforts to convince them but I'm not going to convince everybody in every channel and every newspaper. Um, you know, there are examples. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling on, but I'm going to give you one last example of how hurtful it can be. There were 14 people or something in the race that my son was running in. The New York Times uh, uh, that was put, uh, endorsed Mondaire Jones, who was an African American candidate. Um, and uh, he was running, as he said, to he wanted to be the first black gay guy in Congress, which is fine. And the New York Times endorsed him. And at the time they said, but there are a lot of other good candidates running. And they listed every other candidate, except as my son puts it, they seemed to, they ran out of ink when it came to mentioning him. They literally didn't mention. And he was the, I thought, of course, the most qualified candidate. Of course, next the next week, they seemed to find a new barrel of ink to say that son of farmer rich guy trying to buy election. So you're not gonna win with some newspapers. And by the way, I have learned that just like you don't convince 100%, 100% you pick whichever channel, whichever media, whichever newspaper, I'm on the inside right now and have a lot of things going on. I guarantee you, none of them are getting it all right. So you can't live your life that way. You gotta live your life from the inside and convince uh, the world that you're trying to do the right thing. 
Well, the world is a much better place, Dr. Schleifer, because you have been doing the right thing and continue to do that, literally healing healing diseases and cutting edge of building culture of company. And I'll just say this also because I, I was minimally, but a little bit as much as I could involved in, in Adam's race for him. It's a loss to the pro-Israel community because what Adam stood for and stands for, particularly in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship, in, in taking over that seat from somebody who was a model of being pro-Israel and forget which side of the aisle they represent or what the district it leans towards, but it's a loss for the pro-Israel community and it's a sad loss for the wrong reasons. And I hope he isn't disheartened. I hope he comes back because we need him and we need good people and we need people who can't be bought or won't be biased because of, of uh, money. And so that is that is a big loss, but you are an inspiration. You have been for many years to me. Can't thank you enough for your time tonight and what we said is a incredibly busy time and um, God should continue to bless you and, and your amazing and beautiful family to continue to lead in a way that's making the world a, a healthier place and a better place and shut out the noise. We live in such a divisive time and people dig in their heels and they take sides and then they read in narratives where they don't belong. And, and, and obviously I don't know nearly what you know, but I know some of these stories, how fake news they are about relationships and predispositions and biases. And it's an absolute joke if people knew the truth of, of where it is. So Please continue to do the right thing and and shine that light and and your amazing wife Harriet, her leadership at AJC and through your synagogue and I know you've been supportive of Chabad in your neighborhood and so many Jewish causes and thank you for all of that. Thank you for giving us some time on what is a really really busy night. And we wish you a beautiful uh, Sukkot holiday of Sukkot and love to the family. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, and I wish I could come be there, especially to give your mom and dad a hug. So please give them my love uh, and thanks to. Uh, Rabbi Boyd and Rabbi Moskowitz uh, for not peppering me with uh, their own questions. <laughs> and I hope you'll invite me back again sometime in the future. I'm, I'm, up, I'm up for that round of golf. Exactly. <laughs> when, this, when this Please God ends, we look forward to playing golf again together and look forward to you having some downtime that's well-deserved. Thank you so much for Thank your time you. tonight, Doctor. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. Wow. All right. Gentlemen, to comment on that. Are we allowed to comment on that interview? I got a lot of <laughs> comment as long as we keep our comments. No, no, I'll tell you this. I, I, I'll Why? tell you this. It, it was, it was obviously, a, an, I actually got a text from someone I haven't spoken to in a while saying, is this not like the greatest interview I've ever listened to? Um, such an impressive person. Obviously, you know, the word mensch like comes right to your mind. And, you know, it struck me with so much of it. I've heard from your dad along the years. Um, when your dad has spoken at BRS, he's always highlighted that the number one thing he was the most proud of was the culture that he built, that he obviously with others helped contribute to build at Regeneron. Um, and, it, and it really came through in a very powerful way in the way he was describing how everyone was bought into the system and they treated everyone with respect and dignity. And I loved what he said about if you do good, you'll do well. What a great line, right? Do good and you'll do well. Um, and, and so much of what he said just reminded me of your father. So I'm sure it was a lot of nachas for you as well. Sweet. It is, it is. And I wasn't sure that that connection was going to be brought up tonight. And, and But I am, you know, the greatest uh, the greatest yichus in the world and couldn't be prouder for this and a million other reasons of that emphasis of doing right and doing good. And, and you know, I know Dr. Schleif for a long time. He was at my wedding. And and when, when that company, you know, he said how many years it was open before it was profitable. Before it was profitable, it was on the brink of going out of business. It wasn't clear. They had several um, scientific efforts that that failed um but again as he said you know if, if you take care of patients the profits will follow that's also another another great line and he and he is a mensch and it's complicated and he has a wonderful family and they've been involved philanthropically and, and making a difference and um I, like i say the world's a better place because of of that company which is healing diseases and you know we didn't get into it but it's somebody that we know who's got this fop which is a, a rare bone disease and it's 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 a horrific disease like he said there's a hundred people in the world what company in the would take that on why would that be where they would work to find a, a cure but if you can if you can change the lives save the lives of a hundred people that's where they're at and um there was a lot of inspiration that you know it didn't come up but my dad mentioned to me i didn't get a chance to bring it up his father he mentioned that harry's parents were holocaust survivors his father has had an incredible memory like a photographic memory so he was enlisted or brody you'll appreciate this especially with all your march to the living work he was enlisted to testify at a lot of trials against nazi criminals because of his photographic memory as a survivor that he was able to come and totally prosecute them with firsthand you know memory and knowledge facts, real facts because, yeah real facts not speculation right. so uh, yeah he, he was great you know one thing that that i really really i mean again maybe i could ask your dad for his email address got some follow-up <laughs> questions 
<laughs> his phone number. No, but w seriously, one of the things that that's always bothered me is that you have a CEO of a for-profit company, and this is really every one of these you know great CEOs who, who have accomplished so much. And like he mentioned, the company wasn't profitable up until 2012. And how many IPOs have just uh, you know companies just gone public in the last couple of weeks? Where they haven't shown one dollar in terms of profit, they have billion-dollar valuations. You're talking about so many companies like Amazon, which only recently became profitable, and yet they're allowed to dream, they're allowed to market, they're allowed to make mistakes on the way to success. Whereas a nonprofit, you know, we have all these great ideas, we have visions of of, of, of huge programs, but you try put out a program which is a loss or it's going to lose before it's going to hit. It could be five years down the road. We've got a big plan, or ten years down. No one's gonna. You can't go more than a day if you if you if you show a loss on a program. You're not gonna get a chance to do it again. Know, I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit, and I understand your comparison. I love the obviously drawing what we learned from the for-profit world to the non-profit profit world. But it's actually one of the things that I admire about our lay leadership. Um, I don't. I can't remember the last time our lay leadership told us. Um, you guys better watch this. If this fails, your heads are on the line. I don't think I've ever heard that in my 11 years. I don't know about you guys. You've been here a lot longer. But I think one of the things that I've always admired, and it attracted me from day one to BRS, was that our lay leadership was always matched our entrepreneurial drive. Right. And I remember when we first came down, you know, the, the president at the time was like, dream big and go big or right. go home. And and I think that's always been our, our calling I'll, card. And we've never been afraid to fail along the way. We're, we're very lucky. We're, we're the exception. But I think I, I, you're 100% right. In terms of ideas, you're 100% right. But when it comes to marketing beyond our shul, to which is really what we want to do, you know, where, where companies really put a lot of their, their money is in terms of marketing, we're, we don't have a marketing budget. And no synagogues and no nonprofits, they don't. You, you can get an ad on TV if you can find it at 2 a.m. and it's free, right? right? But you can't sell a can of Coke without right. a marketing platform. And nonprofits don't have it. And it's just, right. it's unfortunate. How are you supposed to grow like that? Yeah, uh, those you are know? great observations. I think that BRS, the culture, we're very lucky also, which took a lot of effort and our lay leaders deserve a lot of credit for it. But I think that we're more the exception. There's not a lot of room for error in, in the in the non-for-profit world or not a lot of margin to experiment or push boundaries. We're very, very lucky in that way. Um, but I think that's one of the messages also of this conversation tonight is that don't give up on your dreams. And even if you fail I several it. times, it's one of the messages of the whole period of chuva that we're in and sukkahs and you could stumble you could fall several times but get back up because you don't know the best is yet to come so it's it's uh we're half an hour in and i know some people are now competing with some things that others might want to watch but don't go anywhere because we got a lot more to talk about tonight and even if you're going somewhere you could always listen later on your favorite podcast player don't forget rate and review get the message and inspiration out there and help our podcast we we've got we've got another a-lister guest next week. I'm not going to announce it quite yet, but big another time. a lister guest, big time, big, big, big time. So behind the beam is going big. I was actually thinking that, you know, I, CNBC, Fox News, Dr. Schleifer has been on every multimedia, major media outlet. Rabbi Brody, when we're done tonight, you've got to, this is where he gave the inside scoop about helping the president and what he's heard from both sides and setting that record clear. And, you know, we'd love to see Love to see CNN and Fox News referencing behind the beam of podcast where Dr. Schleifer cleared the record. Let me ask you a question. When you heard that that Regenwin was on the news tonight, did that was it? Have you ever seen timing like that before? Could you believe I'll, it? I'll, 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 I'll give our, I don't think I've ever seen Rabbi Goldberg so nervous in my life. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit nervous. A little nervous. Listen, you know what? There's no one in the world I have more respect for than my dad, and I'm incredibly close with him, and I wanted to do good with him. And uh, he worked many years with Dr. Schleifer, and I wanted to make sure that he would be proud of the conversation that we'd have tonight. <laughs> so probably more nervous than the last 20 Shabbat Shiva Drushas combined. <laughs> but here we are and feeling good about it, and let's, let's actually – quit while we're ahead on that conversation. We'll move on to other <laughs> topics. We've got some other really important topics to talk about tonight, other uh, exciting topics for tonight. So I know we all have an exercise at our Sukkot table where we uh, invite Ushpizen, other than the great seven shepherds that the whole Jewish people invite in. And I bring, I believe it's brought down, and someone reminded me, I think the Nitte Gavriel quotes, it's not just Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and so on, but their wives come as well. We welcome the couples, the units to our sukkah to be our guests on sukkahs. But I think we all also entertain the conversation, maybe this year more relevant than others, where our sukkahs are absent guests that we're used to having, family and friends, of asking our table, our family, or ourselves, if you could have, you referenced Rabbi Moskowitz in a drusha, um, if you could have as a guest in your sukkah or in life, if you could have a coffee and conversation with anyone, 
who would it be? Jewish, non-Jewish, alive or deceased? Who would you want a conversation with? So if you're going deceased, I mean, obviously Jewish history is very vast. I, I would, and again, I'm not, I was not brought up this way. I would love to have a conversation with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I would love to have Yechidus mm. with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, I don't think there's anyone, and this is a little dangerous what I'm about to say, but I really, certainly in the last 50 years of, of, of American world history, I don't think there's anyone who's had such a wide impact um, across the globe than the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I'd love to speak to him about the drive, the passion, the commitment to the Jewish people, how he motivated an army of people to really go out there and to, and to bring people closer to Hashem. So if we're including people who aren't alive, it would be the Lubavitcher Rebbe uh, for mm. sure for me. Good. Rabbi, Ma Rabbi Brody, what'd you say? You know, as a student, again, of Jew Jewish history, I would love to meet Ezra, Ezra Nehemia, like Ezra. Mm. You know, they say that when he comes back from Bavel and he comes back into uh, Israel, there was like this outreach uh, revolution that took place. Everything turned around literally on a dime, but it doesn't really give you any detail. You don't know what, what did they say? What did they do? Right. right. And I would just love to know what, what brought everyone back? What was that magic? That's great. It's great. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Every year I also give, you know, depending on what I'm reading or thinking about or, or learning, get different reasons. Um, this year I answered Rabbi Yudah Hanasi. I was really curious. Rabbi Yudah Hanasi um, it's a fascinating figure, of course. He he did the amazingly courageous thing to write down and record the Mishnah, collected the notes of all the academies at the time, and coordinated shows what went into the Mishnah, what was in a Tosefta, a Brisa. Um, and when we take it for granted that the Talmud of the Mishnah is the uh, central part of Jewish learning and continuity, it was a radically courageous thing at the time. Undoubtedly, he was highly criticized, going back to Dr. Schleifer and the New York Times, if it had existed at the time, would have criticized him for it. But it, it, it's prohibited. You're not allowed to write down the oral Torah, and he did it. So what gave him the courage and the fortitude wow. to do it? What kind of backlash did he get? What was his vision? He also was very close with the Roman uh, emperor. He was a wealthy man himself, and he navigated. He was a fascinating person. I would love to spend some time with Rabbi Huda Hanasi. What about alive people? What about alive people? Okay. So who do you get? Rabbi Brody, I asked the question. Anyone alive, you can invite to your sukkah. Who would it be? I'm, I'm trying to still be on my best behavior for tonight's no, episode. Either. Can we ask him? Can we, can we answer him this next week? Who would you say, Rabbi Moskowitz? Anyone alive. So again, my answer in the sukkah, because that was the game we played in our sukkah. It couldn't be someone dead. It had to be someone alive. That's and it could not be a family member. Um, right. And I, and again, I'm not a Chabadnik, but I wanted to meet a Chabad rabbi from the most far-flung place um, on earth who's, I, I would love to have a conversation about what drives a person day and night for the Jewish people. Complete selfless devotion to every single Jew, no matter how many, no matter how few, to commit your life to Avas Yisrael. I would love to have a conversation about that. So, so who's that person alive today? No, I said it could picture a rabbi in Thailand and you know Uzbekistan. The the place is that is less relevant than the concept. In other words, I would like to take someone who has gone to a far flung place on Earth and committed their life to one, two, three Jews in a town just to bring them closer to Jerusalem. What causes that selflessness? How do they stay you can motivated? Do it. How do it's they stay Chabad. driven? It's not hard. I, know. The well, I, I, said that in, I said that in the Stiebel meeting and, and Alan Berger said, it's one phone call away. <laughs> yeah, just so, chose the about, most far-flung place and it's not hard. How about you, we, Rabbi? Go, can we, have that guy from, have, we had that guy from India, remember? In fact, yes, one of our did. listeners just told you, Chabad Shlech Lipschitz from Katmandu. Katmandu. So we'll get that, you the number and you could have that, be, you could have that conversation. That would be, how do you not get burned out? How do you keep going? What drives you? What motivates you? I think those are, how do you keep your children? I think those are, those are questions that I'd be very curious about. What about you guys? Yeah, I don't know, but I, I think it's actually telling that I'm struggling to think of who that is. I, I don't know if that's because I've had the privilege of meeting some of my heroes or because no one jumps out today as that enormous hero as much as the people of the past. It's a good, not to say we don't have heroes today. We do have heroes in the Jewish and non-Jewish world. I don't know. I need to think about that. I'm not sure who that would be, someone who's alive. I'm not really sure. It's a good question. It's a good question. So we we actually, again, we're an apolitical show. We're not getting into politics. Um, but we have been reached out to. Florida is a swing state. Florida chooses presidents. Uh, those can recall the hanging chads. It was actually our voting precinct and the next yeah. one that determined the outcome of the election. 
mostly because people didn't know how to vote and the hanging chads, but we determined the outcome of, of that election. So, well, they um, never said we, you had to push it all the way through. No, that only unclear. came out afterwards. It was unclear. So we have been reached out to by representation of both campaigns, of the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign, asking if Booker Thorn Synagogue would host, not necessarily the candidates, but maybe a surrogate of theirs. I doubt the candidate. I don't want to pretend that either of them were coming to the beam of the Booker Thorn Synagogue or behind the beam, um, but probably a surrogate. And well, We've had uh, them in the it, past. Yeah, you know? That's what I was going to raise is the right. question. Should shul, should synagogues host political candidates? Should politics and religion mix in the sense of a synagogue or a shul hosting a political candidate? What did we answer both campaigns and what should we answer? Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I'll tell you what we answered both campaigns to our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we believe an educated customer is, is the best customer. And therefore, as long as we give equal opportunity and equal time and equal publicity to each side of the aisle and, right. you know, maintaining our bipartisan nature, then it's our obligation. It's to educate our members, to provide them with a forum, to make an educated vote. Um, and as long as we obviously, none of us would ever share our political views from the pulpit, from a podcast at any point. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we've opened the door to either side, but as long as it's made clear to our congregation and beyond that both sides are given equal opportunity, equal time. Now, I will say this. I don't know why they would want to come to BRS for the following reason, because historically we have two uh, presidential candidates who the day after speaking at BRS actually withdrew from the election. It was both primary candidates, uh, but in both cases, they withdrew from the election the day after. So yeah. BRS doesn't necessarily have the best track record um, as being a school exactly for being elected president. But I agree with you wholeheartedly, and that's the argument that we've made before in, in writing and in speaking. First of all, and I think it's important, we would not host a political candidate in a way that would make everybody um, uncomfortable, meaning on a Shabbos morning, not, right. not talking during Corona times, but when people come to shul to find peace and safety and um, don't want to deal with politics, they want to deal with inspiration, we would not hold them hostage oh. by allowing a candidate to speak Shabbos morning. So we, we know, would host when them. We have, hold on. I, and when we Ed have, Ron. it was the context. No, when we have, it was in the context of the American Israel relationship. Like even when we've had politicians, it was never their candidacy that we were interested in. It was their position vis-a-vis the Israel relationship. So whether it was um, Eric Cantor, who at the time was the majority leader, he Ron came to BRS. Ron, but again, he spoke right, but about it was not, it was not it was before it was he was not, governor. It was, it, it, but it was not part of the campaign. It was before he was governor. It was not part of the campaign. And he came, he had returned from a trip to Israel and he came to report on the U.S.-Israel relationship, his trip to, trip to Israel. Right. And we had clearly arranged it would not be a campaign speech. So on a Shabbos morning or when there's a uh, hostage, so to say, audience, we would never allow a campaign speech. Um, so when we've held candid hosted candidates, it's been when people choose to come. So those who want to come in here will come, and those who don't, don't. We, of course, honor the law and the system, which is when we host, we always invite representation from the other side. Right. We're not trying to bias people in one direction or the other. But exactly what Rabbi Moskowitz said, which is that um, if we want to sit at the table, you want to inform the conversation, you want the candidates to know what we care about, what we value to whom they should be accountable, then there's no more powerful way than playing than playing host. And when you say thanks but no thanks and go on to the next venue, what you've done is write yourself out of the conversation. Right. And I'm not going to say that we at PRS can take credit, good or bad, for any policies of any administrations, but we've been very blessed with very special opportunities to be able to voice our opinion, literally in very sacrosanct places that others don't have a lot of opportunity. And, and I think that's because we've positioned ourselves as a place that is engaged and that cares and that and that uh, advocates for the U.S.-Israel relationship in particular. We've never, ever endorsed. Uh, the greatest, most satisfying thing to me is when I get criticism from members of our shul in both directions, saying that it's obvious who I care about, it's obvious who I'm voting for, it's right. obvious who I support, both and sides. I should stop using, and I should stop using the pulpit for that. Right. And both sides say that, then we know we're doing something which is right. So but when it's was a very the fine line. In your 20 years here in BRS, what was the the most difficult moment when when you felt that tension on both sides? I I would probably say maybe the Iran deal. Maybe I mean I remember that was like very very um, emotional for many of our members. And obviously there was a lot going on with APAC in, in the local community. Right. Is there another moment that like jumps out of your mind as a moment where you were just like, it's getting a little bit too, uh, you know, we have to like tone down 
the conversation yeah. in the show a little bit? Yeah, I'll tell you when it was. It was in the 2012 election when one member of our shul told another member of our shul who was voting in for a certain person that they are a self-hating Jew. And when that person came to me and said, I just want you to know I'm not going to become a shul anymore and I'm resigning my membership because I come to shul for inspiration. I come to shul for safety. I come to shul. Uh, you know, I, I get that chaos and I get that conflict outside of shul. Right. You know, if, if I want that, there's plenty of places to go. That's not why I come to shul. And my heart broke. That's when we convened a committee to work on a Derek Heret statement. And we put out our Derek Heret statement. And we worked hard in order to ensure that because that was, I think, the worst. What's amazing is we're now up to like the third presidential election cycle in recent memory in a row where we've said, this is the election that matters more. This is the most divisive. This is the one that's, and I shudder to think what's going to happen in the next 30 days over the next month. Right. Uh, you know, I think relationships are really, really tense and are being severed. I'm going to write about this and I don't want to get into it too much right now, but I got a call from someone who's a, I consider a close friend who's in the community um, two weeks ago who said, I'm not renewing my membership and I love so much about you, but the fact that you would vote in a certain way or support a certain candidate or their policies, I just can't trust your judgment, connect with you anymore. I just, I, I can't have that relationship. I, I was almost moved to tears. And by the end of the conversation, of course, we were close friends again and we're able to focus on the 99% of the lives we agree on, we care about, and, and, and we're not gonna sum up our total relationship by what will be a moment in a in a voting booth where we can legitimately be on different sides of of a conclusion about what to do, legitimately be on two sides of of what to do. But I fear that the, within families and friendships, they're breaking up. People are really there's a lot of tension. I, I think even, in this way, Corona may be a vote? blessing. How does, how because does even... I, I will never ever ever address these things from the pulpit. I'm right. happy to talk to people behind the oh, bima. Oh, People who want to have conversations offline where I'm not wearing my rabbi yarmulke or hat and I'm just a private person, I'm happy to tell you my thoughts yeah. and where I am on things. I'm not going to do it now or on the show ever, right. but I'm happy to have that conversation. So he knows where I was. Can, and Can you whisper? <laughs> no, but there are rabbis. With... That no, there are rabbis. That we know both Orthodox and other denominations where not publicly from the pulpit, but they'll use a private blog or a different avenue to strongly voice political views. Um, and and that's been met with mixed results from their right. congregants who some feel that that's appropriate, that they should speak out, that they're private citizen, they're allowed yeah. to have a voice. And others say, I don't really want my rabbi doing that. I want the shul, as you said, has to be a safe space. And my rabbi has to represent that also. Um, and I know that's something that you, you know, I based on your leadership, um, we've worked hard on a lot is to make sure that everyone feels comfortable in the shul. Yeah, let me say this, which I know some aren't going to agree with, but that's life these days. Dr. Schleifer is my hero. You got to just say say what you believe and 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 hope for the best. So I, I will say this. You. Yeah, no, they'll be they'll be okay with this one. So if to me, if the last eight or twelve years taught us anything, eleven and a half or seven and a half years has taught us anything, it's that while presidents matter and they shape policy and both domestic and abroad, and it's really important. And I'm not minimizing it. Let's be clear, I'm not minimizing it. But the country and the world is bigger than the president. And as believing Jews of faith, ya lev malachim biyad Hashem, right? We are religious personalities. We believe in God. And we believe that God is also behind pulling the strings somewhat. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't hesitate to advocate or campaign or lobby for the things and the policies that matter and matter dearly to us. But we also need to have a sense of context and a sense of perspective. And let me tell you what I mean. So the, the president before the one that's in office right now, right? And, and I'm not not use, I'm not going to use either name because I don't want to distract people. But we heard from people then in one direction that this is Nazi Germany all over again. He's going to destroy Israel. He's destroying Judaism and the Iran deal. It's the end of the Jewish world. And this is the end of the world as we know it. And for the last four years, we've heard about this is the end of the world as we know it. And this is a disaster and he's destroying the world and he's destroying and he's destroying and he's, he's endorsing people who hate Jews and so on and so forth. And I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate criticisms to be offered in both directions. All I'm saying is if the eight, last eight years have taught us something, it's that the country, the world, as God-fearing Jews, there are things much bigger than the president. So it matters. It matters a lot. We should care. But so do our relationships, our family, our friendships, our community. We need to have a sense of context, a perspective. We need to know that president will be there for four years and maybe eight. And in that time, there's a lot that can go wrong, a lot that can go right. There's a lot that can happen. But God's also involved in that outcome. God's also involved in those results. God is also involved in shaping exactly what's going to be happening. And 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 that's where our 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 
being religious needs to inform our attitude is not to speak in hyperbole and not to speak or to blow things out of proportion and to yes, care and yes, campaign and yes, advocate. But in the end of the day, also realize that there's Hashem and he's behind it and that the world and the country even is bigger than a president. And yes, it'll be four years or eight years, but then there'll be another one. And I think that's what the last eight years have taught us where the predictions that people made. If I had a dollar for every person, even within our shul and locally, let alone celebrity on TV, who when Obama was elected said, if he wins, I'm moving. If Trump is elected, I'm moving. None of whom ever moved and are still here to talk about it afterwards. Are, are there impacts? Are there results? Yes. But I think the world is bigger. You know, I have two, two thoughts. First of all, you know, one of the things that jumped out at me when Dr. Schleifer was talking was he said, like, you could, you could make a treatment for one small thing and you have no, no idea that it's going to help you in a different realm or it's going to help cure 15 different things, right? And that's kind right. of the way the world works, right? We think we understand that like the world goes from A to B to C, but we know it's a, it's a lot different. The Perm story drives that in for us, that there's a lot that we don't understand. There's a lot out of our control and that, that's 100% where our Muna and Hashem right. comes in. Um, the other thing I just, just an observation as you were describing the years, it corresponds with the explosion of social media, right? Mm. I mean, if you look at the years of those elections, it really is when Facebook, Instagram, where those echo chambers of our lives became much more popular. And I wonder if like there's a correlation between those experiences in social media and us being only exposed to a certain perspective and the polarization of our communities, of our families, of our relationships, our inability to see things from other sides, because all we get bombarded with is my perspective. And I feel validated in my perspective because that's all I see all day. So I wonder if there's a correlation mm. between like the evolution of the Facebooks and the other social media, Twitter, sure. and sure. that organization. Which is being manipulated by people. Rabbi Brody, what were you going to say? That's no, just funny. I'm thinking back to like 92 when I voted for, uh, for uh, when I registered you know, as a Democrat, voted for Bill Clinton. The only reason I knew about Bill Clinton was just because he came on the Arsenio Hall show back then. And I was in 12th grade, I think it was. So it's just, you know, it's funny how back saxophone, then, the only, the, the only way to play the saxophone, I remember, I was like, this guy is the coolest guy I've ever seen. And, um, you know, the way you, that was the only place I ever got a chance to, to really interact, right. I guess, so to speak, with a, with a, with a candidate. Today, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's every second that's in your face. And now, I think Robin Moskowitz was in diapers at the time. And now people are like, Robin, there you go. Robin Moskowitz was saying is that, you know, both sides are trying to use social media and manipulate it. They know the algorithms. They know what will keep people involved, the controversy. And and uh, and the social media platforms themselves are interested into that because the longer people stay on them, the higher they can charge for advertising, the more money they can make. And they're not about trying to heal wounds. They're not about trying to create unity and peace. They're not about trying to speak about the things that we all have in common. If we focused on the fact that we're all patriotic, we love America and America's values. We care about the user of the relationship and how that will best be realized with which candidate or their policies. We can have a legitimate discussion or debate, but let's begin with the premise of no. what we all care about, agree on, and build from there. Correct. And, that, and that's my point is that social media is not geared to that at all. And if anything, they, as you said, they fear off of our worst, um, you know, our worst demons because they convince us into this polarization. And to me, that's the real issue. As you said, presidents come, presidents go. But it's where this whole social media, AI, the ability to really understand our thinking mm. and to play off of our worst selves, basically, against each other. To me, that that to me is a far bigger danger to the country. The world. Yeah. Not anyone yeah. cares. I, no, he's not. He's laughing at the at the <laughs> comment that we'll, we'll share yeah, the comment right now. We'll share that comment. <laughs> so um so yeah for our listeners who are curious for our listeners who are curious first of all somebody asked you can always catch up if you missed the beginning of the interview with dr schleifer which you know i i we're obviously we're obviously streaming live so i don't know it's probably already been picked up by cnn fox cnbc new york times wall street journal this is where the this is where behind the beam dr schleifer shared the inside story about healing the president with their experimental uh covid cocktail antibody cocktail so it's probably been picked up maybe our listeners can let us know but if you missed the beginning of that interview you can always catch up on any podcast player it'll be posted soon after youtube on our youtube channel we have uh, the full uh uh every edition we're in season two we didn't even mention season two episode three season two episode three you could always listen and again if you're listening to the podcast please rate and please review a couple other things to get to tonight um and one is unfortunately a really shameful story a really deeply disturbing story right in our backyard. And that is 
the Spanish River principal, the high school principal of Spanish River, which is a public high school right in our neighborhood, right in our backyard, was fired in 2019 because emails were uncovered where he had com corresponded with a parent where he said that he cannot uh, acknowledge that the Holocaust happened. He essentially denied the Holocaust. Now, that is egregious. It's inexcusable. It's indefensible. Um, in its own right, it's intolerable. Here's the part that's even more intolerable to me. He has never apologized. He's never taken responsibility. He's never owned up to it. And he was fired. He was let go at the time. And he appealed the decision. And it went up. Uh, and and uh, there was a settlement that was reached with the school board. And ultimately, uh, it was decided that it was a uh, unlawful dismissal. Uh, but there was no responsibility to rehire him. And just today, earlier today, he yes, was sir. rehired as the principal of Spanish River High School. Now, this is a man who denies the Holocaust. And even though I was criticized for posting this earlier today, I'm going to make the comparison again. I just want to imagine in 2020, if a high school principal, a public high school principal, was found to have emailed denying that slavery ever happened, would they ever be reinstated? If they denied an entire demographic, a persecuted segment of society, that their history was true, would they ever be reinstated? It is intolerable. It's inexcusable. It is disgusting. It's reprehensible. And I don't understand who could have possibly voted. He received a settlement, send them packing, career change, take your Holocaust denial and go somewhere else. But to put him back in a role of education, of shaping the minds of young people, it's inexcusable. It's, and, inexcusable. And it's, not, it's, it's not like we're in uh, you know Tennessee. You are in Palm Beach County, which is the number one place in the country of Holocaust survivors. I mean, this is literally, right. like you're surrounded by Holocaust survivors all around. Could you add insult to injury than in Palm Beach County, having someone who denied the Holocaust? And Did you, that, you, are, are you sure that he got, he got placed back at the school? Yesterday yeah. I saw that the judge no, today, overruled it. No, no, I didn't today, 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 no, it's up for really, a vote today. Yeah. Really. Today it was, and today wow. it was awarded. Now I just, I just realized, and therefore we're gonna actually give him a second sponsorship of another episode because how late into it. Um, but our good friend, Gil Stein of Hercules oh, Riffing is sponsored oh, our episode. We jumped into it with Dr. Schleifer. Shame on us. We apologize from the bottom of our hearts. But for the cost of one sponsorship, he's getting two episodes. He has sponsored uh, tonight's episode in honor of Tefillah's Geshem, Hercules Roofing, Levracha Valola Klala. The rain may not be welcome to all of us, but is always welcome to a roofing company. Gil Stein, we love you, Gil. Hercules Roofing, thanks you all you do. And thank right. you for your sponsorship tonight and uh, for this episode. And of course, we're going to uh, mention it again. Uh, he did not give us like roof shingles or anything to display, no product placement tonight. But Gil, thank you for that. Apologize profusely for how deep into the episode we got before we brought it up. Thank you for your sponsorship, your friendship tonight. And we will mention it another episode again from the outset and at the very beginning. And he's always anyway, helped out the shul. I'm saying he's always been there whenever there's a leak yeah, in the... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But again, it's, it's shameful. It's very shameful. And it's the disheartening that this uh, principle was reinstated. And we need to know that it's reinstated by people we vote for. Our votes matter. Elections matter. And, you know, many of us, myself included, go into the go into the election booth, the polling station, and we know the names at the top, right? right? Maybe we know who's running for Senate. Maybe we know who's running for governor. Maybe we know the congressman. Let's be honest. Do you not vote for like the most Jewish sounding name or a name that's similar to your name or like your favorite name when it comes to the judges or the county people? How many of us do that research? How many of us are who, well informed? Who has How the many best of signs us know outside? Who we're voting for, right? Who's got the best signs outside? So we, we need to know that on those local level, that's who's making decisions to reinstate a Holocaust denier. Our votes matter. And by the way, they should matter in the next election to make sure that the very people who reinstated this principle don't represent us again because they don't represent us in this horrific, horrific decision. It's wrong. And in our in our shame on you segment tonight, shame on you, Palm Beach County Palm Commissioner Beach. Board of Education, shame on you. It's a new segment starting tonight. Shame on you to someone shame. who I know and love who has a shame on you segment in her life. Shame on you. Palm Beach County uh, Board of Education for reinstating a principal who has denied the Holocaust. Yeah. Should okay. A picture of him. Can we can we put a picture up in the corner? I'm Let's looking a picture for a picture. Um, Let's end with uh, we'll end with one more topic. This is one of my favorites. Tomorrow night, Soshana Rabba. Tomorrow night and Friday, we have a here. greeting. There we go. Shame on you. Shame, Shame on, on you. you. We've got a greeting in the Jewish world, which is unfortunately getting lost because there are fewer and fewer Yiddish speakers. Not to suggest that I'm one of them, but this is one of my favorite greetings. There's a greeting that you offer, Jews offer on Hoshana Rabbah, which is a gut kvittel. 
Good kvittel. You love that. I love good kvittel. I, I don't know what it means. So I'm going to tell you tonight. By the time Yom Kippur is done, Rabbi Goldberg is, has gone over to good kvittel. I wait all year to, I wait all year to break kvittel, out good kvittel. I could kvittel all over good kvittel. I it sounds like something you would put in your soup, a kvittel. Throw a little kvittel in there. So what is a kvittel? What does the word kvittel mean? The word kvittel is like a petek. Yeah. It's a petek. It means a note. Exactly. Why are we wishing everyone a good note? Who's getting notes? Who's passing notes? Who's giving notes? Who's getting notes? What is a good kvittel? So it comes from the Zohar. Uh, yes, my long gray beard is evidence that I qualify now to study Zohar, but I have not been. I'm not studying Zohar. It's up late at night uh, studying. Yeah. Up late at night studying Zohar. I'm not studying Zohar. But the Zohar shines Hoshana Rabbah in a different light, not only as the culmination of Sukkot, but talks about Hoshana Rabbah as the Piskatava. It's the time of the good note. What does it mean, the good note? The image we have of Yom Kippur, think about Ne'ilah. Rosh Hashanah, 10 days of repentance, Yom Kippur, trying to come close, connect with Hashem, break down whatever barriers are between us, and uh, we want to heal, grow, realize the best of who we can become. And the Ela, the image we have is the gates are closing. So can we still sneak something in? Our hopes, our aspirations, our dreams, our prayers, our wishes? So the answer is yes. Even when the gate is closed, you could sneak a note through. And that's our Shana Rabba. A good kvittal is have a good note. Get that note through. Maybe you slept through Elul and you slept through Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and you let Neila the gates close and you failed to take care of the moment. You didn't daven for the people you know and care and love. You dropped the ball. Maybe you dropped the ball. A good kvittal is a piskatava. A good note. Squeeze that note through the gate. Like the note you put in the kotel, like the note through the wall. Squeeze that note through the gate. It's not too late. Tomorrow night, Friday, I want to wish all of our listeners a good kvittal. They should continue to be sealed for a year of prosperity, of blessing, of good things. We should turn the corner on this horrific pandemic, and right. uh, we should celebrate only the best of everything. So next Amen. week, we've got a, another uh, very Star prominent Star studded. Guest. Star studded. A little controversial guest, but very prominent. And our goal is to remain apolitical, but to go behind right. the bima, talk about how his Jewish identity and his Judaism informs his career and his platform and what he does and what he speaks about. And uh, very excited for that conversation. You're not going to want to miss it. Again, if you're listening on a podcast player, please rate and review. Huge thank you to Gil Stein, Hercules Roofing, Levracha Vlalaklala in honor of Geshem. Thank you, Gil. And we'll be uh, invoking that sponsorship on another episode as well. Thank you so much. Wishing everyone a Moadim Simcha. Thank you from one of our colleagues here in Boca. Thank you for listening and thank you for wishing, putting you up on screen. Wonderful. And uh, everyone pass that note to God. Squeeze it through the closed gate. Squeeze it into the wall. And uh, wishing everyone a happy, a holy, and a healthy evening. Take care, everybody.